You're listening to Biz Quick. This is where Julie and Corey provide quick and useful information to small business owners. Biz Quick is the podcast where small business owners get to showcase their businesses and receive expert advice and guidance in areas many entrepreneurs struggle with. And you, the listener, get solutions, tips, and tricks on real world topics that many small business owners face. Julie and Corey are the experts small businesses hire when they need solutions. And the BizQuick podcast is just one way they deliver those solutions. Let's start the show. Welcome to BizQuick. I'm Corey. And I'm Julie. And today we have Devin Miller on the podcast. He's the CEO and founder of Miller IP Law. He is an entrepreneur, has a couple of companies, and he is based out of uh, the Salt Lake City area. He is. I'm looking forward to talking to him. I'm, I have a very big interest in um, when people need to apply for a patent or for a trademark. I don't really know a lot about the area, so I'll be interested in that. Yeah, well, and it, it's funny because I've always wanted to say I've patented something. <laughs> Just like I always said, I wanted to write a book and that process was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, and, and Devin is a um, pretty big entrepreneur. So I'm, I think um, if I remember correctly from um, a previous conversation that we have with him, I think he said that he started a business when he was getting his MBA as a result of a competition. Yeah, he uh, it, like a lot of MBAs, they have these business idea competitions, whatever you get, you know, assigned to a group come up with an idea um ours we had to do a uh we we're already in a group and we just had to come up with like the the business idea and it was more about the process and not really the actual idea um which was great because i did not like our idea what was your idea um (laughs) it was some sort of home meal replacement thing okay um yeah it was terrible but it they're, sounds terrible. Yeah, but they were like, again, they were more interested in like us writing a business plan and having like solid financials and all of that and like projections, et cetera. So yeah, that's kind of key to starting a business, but I don't know it. And maybe it's just me and I'm being like, I'll use the word snobbish, though I don't think I'm snobbish, but I one of my biggest pet peeves is when I see people post on social media that they want to start a business and they need ideas on what business to start. And I'm like, if you don't know what you want to do, you probably shouldn't start one. Yes, uh, I, I agree. And it's funny because, you know, by the end of that semester, year, whatever, however long it took, um, we had a, a viable business that could potentially make money and nobody did anything with it because there was no passion in the product. You know, it was like, we were like, all right, we're just doing this to get a grade done we're all going to go back to our jobs. Yeah. And I think that passion is important when you are starting a business because you, maybe people don't realize how much time you spend in the business when you first start. Right. I mean, if we hated helping small businesses or we hated this, you know, thing we're building, how quickly would we have quit? Yeah. I mean, that's true. And it's, the passion doesn't necessarily need to be the, you know, I love helping small businesses or, you know, home meal replacement things, whatever it is, you know, if you just want to be your own boss and that's your passion, that's fine. Just pick something that's a little more turnkey, you know, like the, the, get a subway franchise. Don't do not open a restaurant (laughs) unless you are passionate about restaurants or maybe like an orange theory fitness or an F45 or something. Okay. Cause yeah, I'm just going to say that's one, that's one industry you don't want to just, I'm just going to dabble in in restaurants. It sucks. (laughs) But for the record, we do love small businesses. We do. That's not just a show and go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay. So if we're going to um, be talking about talking to Devin and he is an IP attorney, I just have to ask, what do you think is the best invention ever made? I don't know if I can answer that question. It's like asking who the best band is. Or of all time, was. Red Hot Chili Peppers. No, absolutely not. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm totally yeah, I kidding. I, but that's because, I mean, in my opinion, people are like, oh, it's the Beatles or, you know, whatever. But like, the Beatles aren't that good. They were influential. 
a lot of bands were built upon the stuff that the Beatles did. Well, the Beatles stole a lot of what they did from like Elvis and some early like Ex- rockabilly exactly. people. And so that's the whole thing is that like, it's all kind of built upon yeah. each other. So, you know, I had this one conversation I had with a friend of mine who's a musician. Um, yeah, his answer to that is like, it's some band who you've never heard of that uh, only ever played in their garage. That's the best band on the planet. Nirvana. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah. I don't know. So I think, you know, like there are some really great inventions, but if you think just like, what would our world be like without them? Like, okay, so here's a good example. I'm not saying that the microwave is the best invention ever, but I'm going to say this. So I don't have a microwave, right? I don't. And I think pretty much every day I'm like, damn, I wish I had a microwave. It would make this much faster. Um, so it just kind of slows down all my all the processes around like meals for me because I don't have one so I don't I just it's not an option and I miss it but I also know I could easily live without it. I mean I've gone a year without one and sure I've not crumbled. I I use my microwave at least once a day. Yes. But um <laughs> the the funny story about the microwave, you know how it was invented or I'm not even saying invented, discovered. No, I don't. Um and it's amazing how many things have been discovered by poor science practices. <laughs> um, like a, a handful of sweeteners were found, like artificial sweeteners were found because the scientist was in the lab, spilled this chemical on their hand and then later like licked their finger. And it was like, oh, this is sweet. You didn't wash your hands? Come on. That's but, scary. Yeah, but the microwave was... Uh, <laughs> Um, they found out from uh, radars and when they invented radars in World War II, but basically this guy was standing in front of a microwave, an unshielded microwave, and the chocolate bar in his pocket melted. <laughs> he probably got sterilized as well. Um. <laughs> That's fantastic. I had no idea. I had no idea. So uh, just, you know, like, <laughs> that's funny. Um, what so some great inventions. I mean, obviously there's the, like the automobile and the wheel sure. and whatnot, but we're some more that are a little bit more unconventional that people wouldn't think of as being really good inventions. I, I mean, I really don't know. I just, I love all the inventions that we get because of our desire to kill each other. You know, it's like the radar was invented because we were trying to protect ourselves from the Germans and now we have microwaves uh you know nuclear energy was created because we were trying to kill the germans <laughs> we really had some problems with I the know. germans <laughs> um and well war is profitable it, i say that yeah, all the time is, but yeah i mean like i, I think that you know I, i'm going to say nuclear energy because it it is clean it's efficient it's very uh i, I will say renewable okay in a sense especially when you get into like nuclear fusion, which they're working on now, which is another crazy thing that I'm uh, concerned about (laughs) because fusion is the sun's energy and they're creating it on earth right now. And they're using magnets to control it. I have no idea what the science is behind it, but how big are those magnets? I don't know. I'm just like the magnets you're, controlling the sun with magnets yeah awesome we're gonna burn ourselves up one day <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people would argue we're going in that direction yes. and it may not be a bad thing with the way things are going exactly, right now yeah <laughs> interesting all right well i don't know where what i would where i would land on it there's a lot of really good inventions and after that big brain response from you i'm not sure i could say anything <laughs> that wouldn't make me sound like a complete dolt yes. so i'm just gonna pass on my answer Disagree. and let's uh yes you are correct and let's uh let's bring devin in he's been sitting in the waiting room for a while and he's probably getting tired of listening to us talk about inventions and not talking with him yes um we will take a quick break and be back with devin Hey everyone, we wanted to tell you about our latest course, Foundation 52, that will be available on February 15th. This course is built to provide tools and techniques every week of the year and is designed to improve your small business. If you're thinking about starting a business, this is a great resource for you as well. We walk you through sales, customer service, disaster planning, growth strategies, and so much more. Head on over to SB Pace to sign up today. All right, and welcome back. We've got Devin Miller with us. He is the CEO and founder of 
uh, Miller IP Law. Welcome, Devin. Thank you for having me on the podcast. I'm excited to be here. We're happy to have you. Yeah. So you are an entrepreneur at heart. I am. So I, I probably always had an entrepreneur been. I, I really first for, real foray into it other than, you know, a few odds and ends when I was a kid uh, was when I was in MBA school, entered a business competition, started it with a few people I didn't know, had a good enough idea that I bought the partners out, continue to build the investors on and bring people on. And then I've grown that now to be a, a set or an eight figure business coming up on a nine figure business. So um, that one's Love being an entrepreneur, love to do it myself. And then with Miller IP Law, I take that same love and love to work with startups and small businesses to help them with patents and trademarks and copyrights and other things. So uh, my first question is this, and it's not so much um, business related as it is time related. If you've got this, you know, eight going on nine figure business and you've got your uh, Miller IP Law, I know you're married and you've got four kids. How exactly do you have time for everything you're doing? You know, it's, it's, it's always a balance. And some, sometimes in life I do better jobs of balancing it all. And other times balance gets a bit out of whack, but you know, so on the, you know, the startup, I, there's a lot of a team there. So, you know, I'm not the the only one there and I'm, I'm not, I've taken not a, a step back because I'm, I'm still actively involved, but I don't, I'm not the main driver or on the, the person that does the day to day, a lot of that, that's it turned over to, you know, another or some other people that are good with the different aspects of it. So I think one is to build a good team around it. And then two is I, I kind of found that, you know, as I, I have a lot of interests and a lot of endeavors that, you know, kind of for a period of time, I was always working around the clock and you know, never getting everything done. So I kind of came to the conclusion that there's always more fires to put out with the business and there's time to put out the fires. So each day I, I wake up, get to work, put out as many fires, get as much as I can done. And then I put it aside and then I'll, I'll come back the next day and day, do the same thing. And so I had to kind of just say, I'm going to spend time with the family. I'm going to spend time with my wife and kids and other things that are unbusiness related. When I'm at business, I'm going to work as hard as I can, as quick as I can to do as much as I can. And then I'm going to go home and do the same thing with family and, and with my wife. Yeah. I think the, I, I, I don't believe there's such a thing as balance when you're an entrepreneur. I think you go, you put your focus and energy where it's needed at the time, but it sounds like you made a really good transition with that business of moving from working in to working on that freed mm -hmm. you up to do a lot of other things. Yeah. yeah. And I want to is... ask uh, Devin, if you don't mind what the business is, because when I was in my MBA, we all had to, in our groups, do that, you know, build a business type thing, and all of our mm -hmm. ideas sucked. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so getting into it a bit deeper, so I'll give you the short, a little bit longer version of the story. So at the time, so I did a, a law degree as well as an MBA degree at the same time. So I was kind of studying those at the same time. I was also doing uh, about 20 hours as a law clerk at a, a law firm. I just had, we'd had our first or first kid that was about two years old and we just had our second kid. So I had plenty on my plate, but I can't remember now that when I, I've thought about it and I can never quite remember, it was either I saw a flyer or got an email and I can't remember which, that was basically, hey, this is a there's a business competition and it's multidisciplinary. So they got um, an engineer, they got a designer. I can't remember the other person. I think it was a couple different types of engineers. And then I was kind of on both the, the legal and the MBA, but it was kind of one of those competitions where you had everybody to get together. You'd all go to the presentation. They tell you about the competition. You find groups of people that most of us and we never didn't know each other. So you just kind of randomly select who's in your group. So the first year we selected, we came up with an idea to make gym bags gym bags less or smelly and entered in the competition i think we took second wasn't that amazing of an idea so we all kind of just said okay that was fun and then we went about our ways we came back the next year and said oh it'd be fun to kind of do the same competition they're doing it again the second year so group got back together and we we're coming up with some crazy ideas everything from you know self-packaging boxing or boxes to other things with none of which really would have worked or gone anywhere and i remember kind of as i was after a brainstorming session coming home and it was i just ran some marathons i just i've been into running and i'm still um, pretty active in running but had the idea of wouldn't it be cool if you could monitor your hydration level as you're running so that way you could tell if you're getting dehydrated you could better make sure you're hydrated at the beginning of your sporting event or running and that so that was kind of the genesis and taking you back this was in the ideas this was in the years before apple or or iwatch or anything of the fitbit none of those had come out yet so it's pretty early on so kind of 
came up with that idea, mocked it up. I went home with uh, over Christmas break. My dad's an electrical engineer as well. We uh, came up with a, a general prototype that we uh, kind of got to work. I tested it out and we went from there. And then after the end of the competition, we were all seniors. We were graduating, going different places throughout the U.S. And so I said, I'm going to buy up my business partners. And I think it's a good enough idea to continue on. So it was really one of those where I, I just was kind of walking home, kind of brainstorming. And that was the one that hit me. And it uh, then built in. It's actually now evolved from a hydration monitoring to more of a non-invasive glucose monitoring. So wearable to do our glucose monitoring for diabetes. A lot of this technology that we came up with originally does very well in that application. So there's a, start, a slightly longer version of the story. <laughs> no, that's great. And I mean, it, it, interesting for sure. Um, did the, the, the company, that business, that technology, um, is it safe to say that that's why you also got into IP law? Um, no, I mean, I was already going down the IP law route. And interestingly enough, I was because I said I was doing a law clerk. So I kind of got to the under, or end of undergraduate and I did a dual degree in engineering, electrical engineering, as well as Chinese. And at the end of that, I, I didn't know exactly what did I want to be. I knew I didn't want to be an engineer. I liked engineering, but I didn't want to be stuck on a project for months or years at a time, be a small cog in a big wheel. Typically, you have to work you know, 10, 20 years to get high enough up to ever have an influence on engineering projects. So I, I don't want to do that. So it was kind of with the idea of, I like engineering, but I don't want to be an engineer. What do I want to do? And so I had two competing interests. One was I ten tended to like the legal aspect. I'd had an uncle that was an intellectual property attorney, kind of seen what he had done. So I had interest there. Also I had entrepreneur interest. So that's kind of when I went off to graduate school, I decided to get both the law degree for intellectual property as well as um, do an MBA kind of on the entrepreneur side. So it was already kind of fairly well in mind. And I was just already chasing down both of those routes. And then they just kind of fit well together. You are a little bit of an overachiever. That is very <laughs> clear. Yes. I'm sitting here thinking about all the things that I've done or that Corey's done. And honestly, it's kind of shameful <laughs> when you put it up against what you're doing. I will say that it only took me one semester of college to find out that I didn't want to be an engineer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, um, you, 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 out, you outpaced me. It took me almost <laughs> five years to figure that out. So what oh, but i use engineering all the time i love it it's just i didn't want to be an engineer in the in the typical sense of that type of a job yeah it's always good to have a um a, a thinking process that when you can think like an engineer it gives you a lot of advantages especially in the business world i am curious though i want to kind of pivot a little bit the conversation sure. more towards your ip law and i'm I've always been really curious about when do people like know that they need a patent attorney and like what, like what are your typical clients getting patents on? Um, when do people know when they watch Shark Tank? No, I mean, there's a little bit of tongue in cheek, but I mean, there's, there's a decent amount of people that don't know when they need intellectual property until either one, somebody else tells them, two, they see it on a TV show. Oh, well, they, they need one. I, I should probably look into that. Or three, that they're, you know, they have enough experience and background that they've done it. Either they've worked at companies or they've over, already been an inventor or other things on things that they kind of have experience in the background, you know, of doing that. But generally it's kind of, you know, one of, you'll get some people that wait way too long that, you know, they don't know that they need it and then they wait too long and they've either missed deadlines and can't get a patent or they, or they can't get a trademark or they're having issues. And so sometimes you'll get people that didn't know they need it, waited way too long. And then they're trying to come in because they've got someone else that's sending them a cease and desist letter or that they're getting in, in legal troubles. And then we're having to kind of go back after the fact. So, now the question is, is when do they need it is a little bit different necessarily than when do they come or come to the realization they need it. So generally with, you know, I'll hit on kind of the two big ones are generally kind of patents and trademarks. So patents, there's kind of two gating features of how early can you get a patent and when's the la when do you, when you, when's a cutoff to get a patent and then, you know, usually kind of fit somewhere in between there. Earliest you can get a patent is what's what we would call conceptual reduction of practice. Basically what that means is, can you explain your invention? So let's say you come up with the world's best widget, you know, the next iPhone, the next Uber, the next whatever you want to be. And, you know, you come up with a great invention. You say, okay, 
Now I need to get that from an idea stage to where I can actually explain it to someone, somebody in the industry. So I could go to somebody else in the industry and say, this is what my invention is. This is how it works. And I say, okay, I get that. I could recreate it or make that if I put some time and effort into it, but I get how it works. So that's kind of the earliest. If you haven't reached that stage, you're too early. You can still talk with an attorney, get kind of a strategy and a roadmap, but you can't get, you would really wouldn't get started on a patent. On the other side is what the patent is, Anytime you put it out in the public, you have one year from which you can actually get a patent on it. So if you put it out on a website, you do a presentation, a trade show, you go start trying to sell it door to door, whatever it is, once you put it out in the public, you have a year time clock start, or starting from the earliest date. So when you do that, you're going to look at saying, okay, you, you don't want to wait longer than a year after you put it out in the public. So earliest is when you can explain it to a level that people can understand it. Latest is if you put it out in the public, don't wait longer than a year. Generally, I, I say earlier on, at least go talk to an attorney earlier on so you can get a strategy as to when you're going to do it. There's a lot more that goes into it with if you're doing angel investors or venture capital or if it's a competitive industry. So there's a lot more to that analysis that kind of gives you a bit of a gating feature. All, then the other one is trademarks and trademarks are more for brands. So patents are more for inventions, for widgets, for function, something that does something that has a functionality to it. Trademarks are all about, all about brands. So if you think of Nike or Adidas or Apple or Starbucks or Pepsi or Coca-Cola, any of those, they're heavily into brands, right? A lot of the reason you buy their, those products is because they have a great brand. So when you're looking at brands, there isn't a cutoff. There isn't a specific date that you have to file it as opposed to patents. It's it's generally more of when you're built, if your intention is to build a brand, the biggest thing is that you want to protect that earlier on, because if somebody else files a trademark before you, then they can create an issue where you're not able to get a trademark on it. They can largely stop you from using your, or your brand. And then you're either having to rebrand, which can be very expensive. You're having to negotiate a deal with them so that you can both coexist or whatnot. So if your intent is to build a brand company, you're better to do that earlier on when you're starting to build the company. How often do you have to deal with people stealing other people's ideas and, and, you know, brands and all that type of stuff? Because one of the things that uh, I learned is that if you're trying to build something, whether it's a business or whatever, like it's better to share your ideas because people are going to genuinely want to try and help you. And fewer mm. people are going to try and steal those ideas because they've already got their own, you know, their things going on. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it certainly is a bit industry specific and, a, and how competitive the industry is. I mean, this morning and without getting any client details, talking with a client even as recently as today, that they had somebody that's come along and they feel that they have copied their brand. And so the issue is, is if you take a brand as an example, let's say you spend you know, some of the big brands, they spend millions to billions of dollars on their brand, right? They spend a ton on advertising and marketing. Once if all of a sudden you were Coca-Cola, or, you know, Pepsi or Starbucks or M&Ms, and somebody just took your brand and started making their own products, stuck your name on it, you know, then you would have a lot of the value in your business all of a sudden gets depreciated because everybody simply are knocking off your brand. And so it a little bit depends on how you're, what your company is, where the value is and where you're centering it. So a lot of times, if you built a big brand, you've put a ton of time to building your reputation, you're going to want to protect it because that's where the value of your business is. And if somebody else just simply comes and knocks it off you're not going to have any business left to do it now the flip side is is you can take you know there's a lot of companies that do licensing they do cross agreements and so you to take you know huge company disney marvel those type of things a lot of the way they build their brand is by licensing out to stick Marvel on everything, everything from pillows to blankets to, you know, everything and across the board to kids toys and everything else. They're not doing that all themselves, but they're built a brand and now they're licensing it out so they can kind of allow others to use their brand, but they make a, a compensation. So generally it, it kind of depends on your, and on the other hand, let's say you build a brand, but you're really not focused on the brand. You make really good widgets and you don't care as long as everybody buys them from you, you don't care what your brand is or who's putting their brand on it. Maybe you don't care as much, you don't focus on it. So it really depends on the value of your business and how much if somebody else were to copy that, it would be an ouch type of a factor. I um, heard a speech that Sarah Blakely gave a while back. She's the inventor of Spanx, right? Mm -hmm. And she was talking about patent right and when she got her patent for her product and she said that now she has a you know she regularly people are trying to copy what she has created and mm. she does not go after them 
Mm -hmm. like because she does not want to discourage entrepreneurs and because she doesn't feel like anybody can recreate exactly what she's created and she's also pretty much cornered the market like every, like there so she's in that space where she's like i'm not we don't we don't go after people who basically are trying to copy what we have patented but i i'm always curious about the fine line between and maybe there is no intersection here or there's nothing even close but between getting a patent and a, and what that means from a monopoly perspective, right? Because mm -hmm. you have to be able to, other people have to be able to compete against you. So you want competition, but when you have a patent, what exactly does it protect you from? Yeah, and, and I think Spanx is a good example because they do have patents, obviously. And, you know, I worked with another company that's called Red Hat and it's Linux. If you ever know anything about computers and open operating system, they have, I mean, literally thousands of patents and yet they don't go out and actively enforce them. Now, if they ever have anybody come against them, they have a big war chest and it's kind of mutually assured destruction type of thing that, hey, if you sue us, if you come after us, we have a big portfolio that we can, you know, enforce against you and we can or certainly protect ourselves, but we're not going to act actively do it you know and there's kind of that balance and I'll, I'll get to your question just a bit you know Spanx one is one thing that they have going for them is they built a big brand right so they'd be it'd be interesting and I don't know their answer if they weren't a big brand and they were now trying to compete in the marketplace where not everybody knew about their brand, not everybody knew about their product, would they take the same position? Maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't, but it's certainly easier to when you're a huge company, you're saying, yeah, we have all these small or small startups that are going, they're not going to erode into our company or into our business. We'd rather be a good actor, help them along the way versus, Hey, if you spent millions of dollars in R and D, you just a small startup starting to get in the marketplace, starting a company, are going and now you have someone that rips off your idea and starts to do it it's two different situ or two different kind of scenarios that you're looking at now the question on monopoly what can you do with a patent and, and i think that was your question is a patent a patent isn't isn't necessarily monopoly as much as what it allows you to do is stop others from making, selling, producing, or otherwise manufacturing what you have patented. So it's not that you grant you a monopoly. You can get a patent and not do well in business. You cannot, if you don't have a business around it, you don't have sales, you don't, you know, you get a patent for something that nobody wants to buy. It doesn't mean you're going to be successful. Rather, it allows you to, if you put in a ton of time, money, and effort, R and D research and development and everything else, it allows you to capture it such that you get to do decide you know how who gets to manufacture who gets to produce it or otherwise sell your product if you want to let everybody do it and everybody is going and you're fine with everybody competing by all means then you have that option and also allows that option if you have bad actors or people that are knocking you off or otherwise doing it you can control who is going to be able to to use your, your invention that makes complete sense thank you yeah well, we are running out of time. So Devin, if you wouldn't mind, if you could let our listeners know how they can get in touch with you if they need patent help or something like that. Sure, I'll give them a couple ways. So if they're if they have questions, and one of the things we do is free strategy meetings where we sit down, answer your questions, kind of like this, only a little bit more tailored. So if you have, hey, what is a patent? How long does it last? Do I need one? What's the term? You know, what's kind of what is the qualifications for a patent? Any or all of the above. Same thing on trademarks. You can go to strategymeeting.com. You can grab some time links right to my calendar and grab some time, and we can chat that way. So that's an easy way to answer some questions. If you want to just get started, you want to learn more. About about our pricing, kind of what we're about, you know, what or what kind of services we provide, you can just go to lawwithmiller.com. And that one's an easy way to kind of find some general information. So if you want to grab time on my calendar, chat more one on one, go to strategymeeting.com. If you want to just find out a little bit more about our firm, go to lawwithmiller.com. Great. Thanks. And thanks to our listeners. All of that will be in the show notes. So check those out. You can connect with us on social media. We are on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And you can reach us on our websites at sbpace.com or bizquickpodcast.com. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast, like us, and give us a review. We love feedback. We really do love feedback. We appreciate it. You can reach out to us about topics you'd like to hear more about. Just fill out the contact us form, and we're happy to fulfill your greatest wishes. Oh, hey, we wrote a book. It's a number one bestseller, bestseller on Amazon, and it comes with a digital companion workbook. That's it for today's podcast. I'm Corey. I'm Julie, and I'm going to say the name of our book really quick. Oh, it's yeah, called, you should do that. It's called Seriously 
Now what? A small business guide to disaster preparedness. Okay, so I'm Corey. And I'm Julie. And this was BizQuick, helping small businesses across America.